This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. And welcome back, everyone. This is the X-Zone. I am Rob McConnell coming to you from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, Talkstar Radio Network. Let me see. Where else are we? Mutual Broadcast Network. And, of course, on iHeartRadio. If you'd like to send me an email, exxon at exxonradiotv.com on all social media sites, Exxon Radio TV. And if you'd like to find out about the programming we have available for you, 24-7, 365, on the Exxon Broadcast Network, visit www.xzbn.net. My guest this hour, Exxonation, is Dr. Ken Hansen. He is a dynamic author, lecturer, and the founder of Treasures in Time an organization devoted to disseminating knowledge of the biblical and classical world. He has dug on archaeological sites in the Middle East, lived in a politically volatile region of northern Galilee, and taught Hebrew on an Israeli agricultural settlement. He has also worked with a television news gathering operation in a war zone in southern Lebanon, and at the height of the civil war that uh, left the jewel of the Mediterranean in ruins. Joining me now is... Dr. Ken Hansen, and uh, Dr. Hansen, welcome to the Exxon, sir. Uh, good to be with you, and warm shalom from the Judaic Studies Program at the University of Central Florida. Wow, warm is right. Uh, what's your temperature right now? Oh, we're in the mid-70s, mid to upper 70s. It's nice. It's well, very it was, nice this well, time of year. Well, thank you very much for joining us tonight up here. It was, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's about... Let me see your your Fahrenheit down there. So let me. It's twenty five degrees Fahrenheit here. Actually, uh, I can tell you the Celsius. Uh, it's twenty four uh, Celsius right right now. Well, in well thank Florida. you, thank you very much, Doctor. Florida. Have a nice day. Nice talking. To you. <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> Thanks very much for joining us. And um, where did your interest in the um, in the biblical and classical world come from? Oh, my goodness. Uh, I was, once upon a time, a pre-law student at the University of Illinois mm -hmm. in Chicago. And it dawned on me one fine day, you know, it could just be the world has enough lawyers. Uh -huh. And what do you do <laughs> in that kind of a situation? I was a history major, and our professors were always encouraging us to narrow our focus onto one particular aspect of this broad pageant of history. And I was just drawn by my intellectual purity to the seedbed of it all, the ancient Near East. This is where civilization began. So I just hopped on a plane during my senior year and plunked down in Jerusalem, Israel, and started studying and threw myself into it. I learned the Hebrew language while I was over there, and that was really, I think, the most pivotal point in my life, because this ancient tongue also happens to be the modern language of the state of Israel today. Uh, I learned modern Hebrew along with immigrants coming in from all over the world into the modern Jewish state and suddenly discovered I could pick up ancient texts, including the Dead Sea Scrolls, and just cuddle up with them more or less like a newspaper. It's, it's absolutely phenomenal. What, what language on earth has been dead for a couple of thousand years, then revived again and become the, the modern language of a modern nation? It's uncanny. It certainly is. Tell our listeners what the Dead Sea Scrolls are, sir. Here we have a whole library of ancient texts, ancient scrolls, actually, mm -hmm. composed on the skin of kosher animals two millennia ago, wrapped up and tucked away in a series of jars, and some just buried in caves along the western shore of the Dead Sea, which is the lowest spot on the face of the earth, more than 1,200 feet below the level of the Mediterranean. And there they lay, sequestered and forgotten about for 2,000 years. Nobody knew they, were ex they even existed. And here we have this whole cache of entire books we never knew existed before mm -hmm. from the days of Jesus and John the Baptist and King Herod the Great and the Romans. Absolutely uncanny and discovered quite by accident 
in the year 1947 when a young Bedouin shepherd lad was looking for a lost goat and left his flock behind and started poking his head into the various nooks and crannies up and down the western shore of the Dead Sea. It's a moonscape out there, utterly parched and barren and dry and desolate. And he's looking for a goat. After some time, he starts taking big old stones and hurling them into various cave entrances, imagining that that his stone would frighten the beast out into the open if it had gone astray. No goat. Mm. But when he lets loose one stone in particular, he hears something deep inside a cave, the cave where he had thrown it. Sounds like something breaking or, or cracking, almost like pottery breaking. And he hauls himself halfway up the side of the cliff and squeezes through this very narrow cave entrance and stares into the darkness. And there's a whole row of big earthenware jars, pottery vessels, barely visible in the dim light. His stone had struck one of them. That was the sound he heard. He starts rifling through those jars. And most are empty, but one of them Mm -hmm. yields a oddly wrapped bundle of something. He doesn't know what it is. He hauls it out of that jar and heads back to his Bedouin campsite. And they begin to pull away the covering and begin to open this parchment. And it's covered over with this chicken scratch writing. Uh, They speak Arabic, and this is in ancient Hebrew. They don't know what it is. But it's the beginning of the most incredible saga of discovery. You don't need Indiana Jones, let me tell you. You've got all the safe sensationalism you could imagine, and it's right here. My goodness. Who were the authors of the Dead Sea Scrolls? To this day, there is controversy, especially among the scholarly community that I'm mm-hmm. part of. Nobody can agree. Now, of course, I know the truth. Of course. That's, <laughs> that's why ancient, you're on the show. Yes. Yeah, there, there's an ancient Judean sect known as the Essenes, mm-hmm. and that over the years has been the dominant identification for the authors. Now, we can't prove it because they never use this term anywhere in all of their writings, but they are mentioned by an ancient Jewish historian known as Josephus, and he's pretty famous. He wrote lengthy histories about the Romans and the Jews, and of course he mentions Jesus, and he also writes at length in detail about the ancient sect known as the Essenes. And uh, it is the opinion of a good many scholars, and I happen to agree, that these were the authors of this entire set of, of not just a few parchments, but we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of com- some complete scrolls and then thousands of fragments of others. And, and now we're looking at the writings of this mysterious sect. They lived in the first two centuries before the Common Era. And basically, they just withdrew from society. They were convinced that the end was near and that the Messianic age was about to dawn. So they left the great city of Jerusalem, and it was a great city in those days, and other cities throughout the length and breadth of the land of Israel, led by a mysterious character, dressed all in white, of course, who is never given a name. He is simply called the Teacher of Righteousness. The Teacher of Righteousness. We don't know exactly who he was. Again, he's never named. He's sort of an ancient version of Obi-Wan Kenobi, I guess. Sounds like it. So it, it yeah. Uh, so if you think Star Wars, you've got the mentality of this ancient sect. Light and darkness, good and evil, the force and the dark side, and this mysterious teacher of righteousness who leads his flock of disciples out into the wilderness, into the middle of nowhere, to forge an alternate society is the best way I know how to describe it on the very edge of eternity, eagerly awaiting the Messianic age. And there's also a character of great evil who is never given a name in these documents, but he is called over and over again the wicked priest. So if we got Obi-Wan, we've also got, of course, Darth Vader, (laughs) who is in mortal combat with the teacher of righteousness, we're told in these scrolls. And on the holiest day of the Jewish year, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, we're told that this wicked priest, whoever he is, slays 
the teacher of righteousness. And the teacher dies. He's, he's assassinated. Yet his spirit lives on and it energizes this entire community, this whole sect who, who remain out in the desert for a good couple of centuries, writing and reading these endless volumes that they, they produce, in, including also, by the way, at least fragments we have of each and every book of the Hebrew mm-hmm. Bible included in these scrolls, not to mention scores and scores, in fact, hundreds of texts that are not in our Bibles. We never, again, we never knew they existed until the discovery of, of this mysterious cache, 1947. All right, uh, Ken, please stand by. We've got to take our first break. Exo Nation, Dr. Ken Hansen is our special guest this hour. www.treasuresintime.org forward slash news dot html. And you can also go to the uh, Good Doctors YouTube, uh, YouTube channel at that site as well. So once again, that's treasuresintime.org forward slash news dot html. This is the Exo and I am Rob McConnell. Don't go away. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere. 24-7-365. The stories that you were telling us about the you know the the tribe or the group that that are apparently or allegedly wrote the dead sea scrolls has a vague sound of familiarity you know it kind of sounds like the all time good versus evil god versus the devil for sure. you know the teacher yeah, in the desert we, you know we have Jesus. a term for that we call it we call it dualism in the academic world. It's exactly what it is. N- not any shades of gray mm-hmm. here. It's good or evil. You're in one camp or another. And the sect referred to themselves, I should add, as the sons of light. We are sons of light. But the rest of humanity are sons of darkness. Sons of darkness. So this is a great cosmic conflict that's loose in the universe. Okay, so as a scholar, what do you th- where do you think that this tribe went? Because after all, if they thought it was going to be the end of the world, they weren't very good with their predictions because the world didn't end. So, you know, how can we take anything they say as, as valid? Well, of course, in the academic community, we don't discuss such things as valid or not. Why not? We just deal with the literature, but... Uh, just stepping out of that a little okay. bit, uh, I, I like to actually try to get into the mindset of the people that, that we study. And it's a pity, I think, that we aren't really allowed to do that as academics. We just have texts and we talk about literature and it's, it's about it. Mm-hmm. You can't really say, now, what were these people experiencing? Because that isn't considered terribly scholarly. So I'm happy to talk about it with you, Rob. Sure, that's great. Uh, I appreciate because I that. Think that uh, I think that they really sincerely believed yes. in the things that they wrote. And we have what I like to call archetypes, which are more or less patterns, uh, apocalyptic patterns that tend to repeat throughout history. And they were, in fact, on the edge of something in their own day and age. They couldn't see beyond that, of course. But time has a way of telescoping, and it also has a way of repeating itself, doesn't it? Uh, those who don't learn the mistakes of the past are condemned to repeat them, of course, well, we've of heard course. many times. Uh, so they were going through what I would call, now stepping out of my academic bubble, as an apocalyptic cycle. 
it was a cycle. And sure enough, there were dark forces on the horizon. There were freedom fighters all over the land of Israel in ancient times. Uh, and apparently some of them were among the disciples of Jesus. They just wanted to be rid of Rome and to rise up in revolt, uh, sort of like a, a Mel Gibson movie, I guess, and shout freedom very loudly. Mm -hmm. And that they did. It, it broke out in the year 66 of the Common Era. And it was a massive revolt against the Roman Empire. And these ancient Israelites believed that by supernatural power, they would somehow be able to overcome the legions of Rome, the mightiest empire that the world had ever seen. And I'm also convinced that some of the writings of the Dead Sea Scrolls did get out beyond their little headquarters along the shores of the Dead Sea and began to influence the larger population and instill in them a messianic sense that we can't lose this. If God is on our side, we are going to prevail somehow. Uh, on the one hand, it, it's admirable to see faith like that, but on the other hand, it, it can lead to a certain type of madness that we also see repeated over and over again. If we're familiar with the story of Waco in mm -hmm. Texas, uh, I did my own doctoral studies, by the way, in, in Austin, Texas, so I know that country. But, but here you have a messianic, I almost said maniacal, maybe I should have, cult, uh, led by this fellow David Koresh, yes. who, who uh, he and his followers were also convinced they could not lose. And look at the way it went down. Um, in flame, in fire, in yeah. death, destruction, faith can be a horrific thing if it's misplaced. Let me ask you something, enough. Doctor. Here we are in the year 2018. Do we really need faith? I think everybody needs faith of one kind or another. Shouldn't and you again, have faith? Stepping out, of, stepping out of my academic okay. bubble to, to, to say that. But I think that human beings are hardwired for faith of one kind or another. We have to have this. Why? Because we also have to have this thing called meaning, which we can't even define. What does it mean? What does life mean? We all want to know, what does my life mean? And yet we can't even define what meaning is but it's an essential ingredient. It must mean something, and that also involves faith of one kind or another. Yeah, but excuse and, me for asking this, but who says that it, we have to have faith? Where does it say that? I'm talking about meaning. That's something that we have to have in life, and somehow it requires a faith. Of course, it depends on how you define faith also. Uh, faith in a Jewish context isn't just believing in mm -hmm. something. Uh, as a Judaica scholar, I can tell you that the, the word itself actually means steadfastness. You have to be steadfast in what you do, in how you behave, and that involves morals and laws and all the things that we call civilization. Why, why is it wrong to kill people? Why is it wrong to walk into a school and start shooting people up? And yet we all shout, it's wrong, that's evil, that's bad. If there is evil, and if we know this intrinsically, then yeah. there must also be a good. And we have to walk in a certain way, and that steadfastness is what Jews call faith. Okay. All right, let's use the example that you used about the mass shootings. If there is a higher power, why doesn't that higher power step in and do something about it instead of just letting us destroy ourselves? Uh, now, there's a question that's been grappled with from time immemorial, including, of course, the ancients who, who produced these writings. They believed that, of course, there being darkness as well as light, uh, they believed that somehow there's a balance in the universe. And this gets into mystical Judaism mm -hmm. as well, that everything good is balanced by something on the other side. Well, sure. And that all together it works for good. And that's what they had to believe in order to give themselves meaning. Ah, uh, but but they, even, they... even what we call evil mm -hmm. it, it is somehow part of the overall pattern and the overall plan that began way back at the very beginning of time. 
uh, when evil forces were unleashed as well as the good. Allegedly. Allegedly. And of course, it's what we call evil. Um, and, and this gets really philosophical at that point. Is evil really evil if it's all part of mm -hmm. some cosmic plan. These are more religious questions, of course, than, than they are uh, textual and, and sure. scholarly in the sense of what we deal with, but, but they're valid also to, to uh, query. Uh, yeah, I, I think so, and I think that we should ask these questions more often instead of just taking everything at faith value, because we don't know if everything that was written really did happen. You know, we've been sold a, a set of—we've uh, been— given a, a bill of sale and people over the years have believed it because they had no other, they had nothing else to believe in. But when we look at what we know today compared to what we've been told happened, you have to believe in what you are told in order for it to make any sense to you and to the scholarly groups, so the scientists, the physicists, the mathematicians, they look at it and say, uh-uh, couldn't have happened. So who do we believe as the public? Well, well. Again, speaking from a, a Judaic perspective, mm -hmm. uh, the the Jewish world questions everything, and there's a plus to that. Doesn't yeah. accept anything, quote unquote, by faith. Again, it defines faith differently. Faith to many Westerners means you don't question. It means blind mm -hmm. faith. No, that that's not Jewish. Everything is to be questioned. In but, fact, when the Bible is read, every yes. letter is to be questioned. All right, but if it's been uh, questioned all these thousands of years, how come the answers haven't come up yet? Well, because what we can answer is the path that we're to walk. Okay? That's, that's the faith part. You walk a certain way, you walk a certain mm -hmm. path, because that's what defines our morality, our civilization, and if you do certain things, like a school shooting, for example, that's not walking the path. And we require this for our civilization to hold together. Now, that's one level. The other level, everything else, which is what people call theology, that's up for grabs in the Jewish world. We debate it, we talk about it, uh, how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. <laughs> that, those used to be serious questions that, that uh, were debated in the Middle Ages, right? But there are no answers to those things. Who is the Messiah? The Jewish world has no answer for this. Maybe it's an ancient sage. Maybe it's a, a modern rabbi. In fact, mm -hmm. there's there's one fellow in uh, well, he's deceased now, but he was the the great Lubavitcher rabbi in Crown Heights, Brooklyn, of the Chabad Lubavitch movement, Menachem Mendel Schneer. All right, we've got to and take our news break. Please stand by, sir. Exonation. Dr. Kevin Hansen is our guest. www.treasuresintime.org forward slash news dot html. We'll be back after this break. Don't go away. From our broadcast studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, to the world and beyond, you're watching the Exxon Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. And welcome back, everyone. Uh, Dr. Ken Hansen is our special guest, treasuresintime.org. Um, why were certain books from the Dead Sea Scrolls omitted from the Bible, or banned from the Bible, I should say? Yeah, banned from the Bible. There were scores and scores of texts and entire books that never made it into the Bible. And there were councils of sages and ancient scholars who had to decide which books make the cut. And it was a tough job. They decided in the end that certain books are basically out there, basically dangerous. And that would be because they would carry certain concepts, certain mm -hmm. ideas that were not particularly in line with the party line. And I understand that actually quite well, because you don't want people running off and reading some book and then forming a cult and deciding to bury carry yourselves out and wait for the end or become a David Koresh Waco sect either. And some of these books are really so far out that you can get there. 
you can get there. When you have uh, armies of angels doing battle, good and evil, light and darkness, especially for Jews who are very careful about guarding and protecting their core tenet, and that is monotheism. In Judaism, there is only one deity. I'm sorry. There's not two. There's Mm -hmm. not the devil versus God. There is one power in all of the universe. And when you get into some of these books, like, for example, the books of Jubilees and uh, Enoch are are famous non-biblical books that ancient Israelites loved, and we even have little pieces, fragments of them preserved among the Dead Sea Scrolls in the original Hebrew in which they were written. They were wildly popular, and yet the ancient Jewish sages said, no, these are just too far out. This dualism is carried way too far. Uh, For for example, um, some of these books talk about a group of angelic beings who are simply called the Watchers, the Watchers, Mm -hmm. who went astray and rebelled against God at the very beginning. And they looked down from on high and they saw earth women whom they lusted after. And these are angelic beings. And they came down to earth and began to teach human beings in magical arts and the occult. And they also cohabited with these beautiful earth women and produced an entire race of giants. So are we talking about the Nephilim here? Pardon? Are we talking about the Nephilim? We sure are. The Nephilim in Hebrew, which simply means the fallen Mm -hmm. ones. Now, this became hugely popular among ancient Israelites, but traditional Jews down to this day just don't go there. There's a brief single verse in the book of Genesis that talks about these uh, sons of God who came down and cohabited with daughters of men and produced the Nephilim, and just leaves it there. Mm -hmm. Well, it means the fallen ones. And that could mean anything. But this whole folklore arises that, that these Nephilim are, in fact, giants and who grow to incredible stature, hundreds of feet tall, and they began devouring all of human flesh and would, in fact, have eaten us all alive. So what happens? God decides that, that he must put an end to this, and he sends a great deluge a great flood. And that, we're told, was the reason for Noah's flood. Now, the Bible just says it was because wickedness was rampant on the earth, and Noah's flood came. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. It was to wipe out all these giants who would have eaten all human flesh. So let me ask ask you this. Let me ask you this. I'm kind of a logical guy. If God wanted to, to eradicate the giants, why did he eradicate the rest of the people as well, and all the animals? Why did he only save Noah? Was it because that Noah well, was one of his... Wait a second, I'm not finished. You know, <laughs> the, the, you, you're, I find this so contradictory. Like, you know, it's, it seems like a marketing plan. Let's see who's got the best story so we get the best control. Well, sure. Um, and th- that's exactly why the ancient rabbis had such trouble with this and mm-hmm. kept it out of the Bible. It was banned. Uh, but we know people love this story. And, of course, people even today, believe it or not, are fascinated by all of this. You've heard of the Nephilim. Sure. Uh, people people are just, they just gravitate to this sort of thing because it's mystical and it's spooky and it's out there. And it, it kind of it gives an adrenaline rush. Well. Now, the biblical text just says that people were wicked on the earth and that uh, a, a flood was sent. And uh, a righteous family, Noah and his family, were, were saved from that. And then it goes on. But, but the stories of the Bible are very brief. They don't give much detail. They're very succinct. And, and a, a, a lot of scholars look at these and say that these are allegorical stories. These are allegorical lessons. Now, maybe that's so. Maybe we should leave it as allegory rather than try to be so literal about them. But here we are in the year, well, I'll say it again, the year 2018. Do we need the biblical learnings? Like, you know, everybody seems to come to the point where, you know, the Lord is my shepherd. Well, we're not sheep anymore. We don't need a shepherd. And, you know, religion has not kept up with the growth of humanity, sociologically. 
And I think this is why a lot of people are falling away from organized religion now and seeking the, the offshoots of, of a society in which they find themselves being drawn to likeness instead of dividedness. Well, in the academic community in which I circulate, uh, mm -hmm. we, don't, we don't go there. Uh, we, we don't talk about whether religion is good or bad or whether we need religion. We're neutral. Why? We just look at texts. Oh. And we try to understand what was going on in the text. Now, just as an individual, mm -hmm. uh, that's my place to, in my case, I'll defend religion, whether it's uh, Judaism, mm -hmm. uh, which, which I'm, I'm part of the Jewish community, mm -hmm. or Christianity, or Islam, or whatever. Uh, I'll, I'll defend it be because we need to be able to root our morality, our ethics in something that's beyond ourselves. So, so you're saying and, that, that as a human race we cannot rule ourselves without we need a governing body called religion? Well, we've had many experience, experiments in government that have tried to rule ourselves. Mm -hmm. And somehow, over and over, we'll see through history and especially in the last century what government without an overarching sense of, let me call it natural law, something that's out there in the universe that we must discover and apply, well, uh, we're free to do anything. We're free to make variable sociological law, or in fact, no law. And the, the most despotic regimes uh, on the face of the earth, of course, have written, risen within the last century. And I'm not only talking Hitler, but the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. China, which massacred multiple, multiple, multiple millions of people. Well, wait a sec. Uh, hold course, on here. Hold on here. Hold no on religion, here. Religious sense just, just a sec. So, you just so brought so a point I, up. I do see that there's something there. You just brought a point up. If God, in his infinite wisdom, mm -hmm. destroys everyone on this planet and every living entity on this planet, except Noah and two animals by two, didn't he just do the same thing? Like he killed his own children. How do you justify that? Well, again, I'm not saying that I take the story literally, but uh, when, when we identify evil going on, mm -hmm. what are we prepared to do to stop it? Now, uh, let, let's take the Second World War, which most people will, will say was a good war. And yet, if you, if you want, you can say we committed genocide as well, because the, the sheer numbers of people that we, that we shot dead, that we firebombed, Dresden, on and on it yeah. goes, and, and, and the atomic bomb, of course, uh, we were willing to do anything. To defeat evil. Yes, but, but wait, what, we're, we weren't the but, creator. But, but, but we weren't the creator. If, we we, we were not the creator. There is no good or evil. I'm sorry. No, I was saying. Well, wait a minute. You know, we just can't have it both ways. Where we can, where we can pay homage to a deity who kills his own, to p teach the rest of the survivors his chosen people. What about the uh, mm. What about the Egyptians going across the Dead Sea, or the Red Sea? What about all the people in Sodom and Gomorrah? You know, like. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I can't. Well, is I there can't. E is there evil in the world? We live yes in a no. we live in a binary system. If there's good, there's evil. There's up, there's down. There's in, there's you know, yeah, there's in, there's out. There's right, there's left. Well, you're just agreeing with the Dead Sea Scrolls, which also had this dualism. But uh, I don't agree with system. I don't agree with the religion. I think religion has way outlasted its use in the, on this planet, and I think that religion has been the cause of more wars and more deaths in the history of man than any other reason. And I've got to take my well, final break. Wrong. And I've got to take my break, be, and we'll be right back. I just, I just cited the... the Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 
401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. And welcome back, everyone. This is the Exxon. I am Rob McConnell. Dr. Ken Hansen is our guest. Treasuresintime.org forward slash news.html. Uh, what I was trying to get at, Ken, is when we look at all the, all the, all the wars in the world, you know, mm. there have been more people who have died because of religious conflict. We're talking yep. millions upon well, millions upon millions of people. And if religion is so good, why do so many people kill in its name if it's not for control? Well, again, I have to take issue with the, the numbers who have uh, perished in religious wars, as horrible as religious wars are. They pale in comparison to what non-religious slash atheistic regimes have produced just in the last century. Uh, uh, way more. Uh, put all the religious wars in history together and you won't find, we have. You won't find a, a hundred million people uh, 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 annihilated. You just won't find numbers like that. So, um, nonetheless, that's not to defend religious wars. Mm -hmm. I mean, and and, and that, I think, is, is why the, the sages of old said, watch out, there are certain books which ought not to be included as part of a religious canon, because they can lead people into basically madness, and that does happen. And uh, it, it's a serious problem when, when you look at the Wacos of the world and the, the cult leaders of the world. And, and yes, there have been and continue to be religious wars. Mm -hmm. And when we look, of, uh, for example, example, at, at uh, certain aspects of radical Islam, sure, and not to mention what radical Christianity has done. However, Christianity had a reformation, and there are those today who are calling who are calling for a reformation within Islam. Um, the president of Egypt, for example, uh, has called bravely for a new reformation within Islam, and I applaud him for that, mm -hmm. uh, I, because I think th that there is real value in people believing in a higher power. Uh, d d talk to anybody in a 12-step program, okay? Uh, we, we can disagree on it, but I think there's value, and I think there's value for all of society. And by the way, the, the United United States, I don't know about Canada, but the United States was founded on the concept of a natural law. And all of our founders accepted that, that, that there is something written out there in the universe. There is a good and there is an evil. And our job as human beings is to apply it, to apply it down to earth and to create a just society. And even though we fail, hey, we're fallen beings. And that is something religion also teaches. But we try, and we have to continue to try. Somebody asked the rabbi, when will the Messiah come? And the rabbi answered, when we make the world worthy to receive him. And I thought that's a marvelous answer. It sounds like when a get-out-of-jail card free, you know, like, uh, I, don't, I really don't know. So, you know, how do you know he's going to come? How do you know he was ever here? How do we know there's a God? How do we know that Moses actually saw and did what it says in the first four books of the Bible. How do we know if we don't well, uh, believe? If it's th That's what scholarship is all about. Of course, we deal with, with not only textual criticism, I deal with biblical archaeology as well. Were, were Israelites ever in Egypt to begin with? I mean, this is a serious, serious archaeological question. And sure, we, we duke it out. We debate it all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, I, would, I would love it if we could find more evidence to conclude, yes, they were. And there was an exodus. I can't prove it. I wouldn't try. Right. Um, but that's, that's not where it, what it's about. That's not certainly what what Judaism is about. Uh, well, let, let's, Judaism let's, is about let's, finding a path to walk on. Let's just talk day. about religion. Period. I don't want to bring one religion in and neglect the others. I want sure. to. I want to talk well, about. And Islam is very much on the same level. They're what we call orthopraxies. It's about doing the right thing, walking the path day by day. So why do we need religion to tell us that? We already know that. Do we? Yeah, we do. <laughs> not everybody has, a, not everybody has a, a, a good path to walk out or knows how to find it. Well, listen, we know that members of the clergy certainly break uh, the covenant as well. So let's, you know, 
I don't know of any yeah, any religious yeah, philosophy. Hypocrisy is, is it, universal, isn't it? it exactly. It sure is. It, it, exactly. All I'm saying is that here we are in the year 2018. The people who wrote these books, they had no knowledge of the solar system, the stars, biology, chemistry, physics, math. Well, mathematics they did because they built the pyramids. That was great. Uh, and, and other sciences that we have developed over time through the ages as we have progressed. I find it, I find it very disturbing at times that scholars in academia really expect us to keep believing in something that was written 20,000 years ago or more with a lot less knowledge than we have today. Oh, scholars don't expect that at, at all. Scholars are officially agnostic, and I can tell you that. We're, uh, we're officially agnostic in, in our scholarly roles. Uh, I've stepped out of that a little, little tonight just to uh, defend religion, uh, but normally we don't, we don't do that. It's not our job to defend one religion or another or any religion at all. So let me ask you this, sir. Over the years, what has academia brought to the table in support of religion? It's it's brought more <laughs> not to support religion <laughs> than to support it because it is lent even more questions to the whole mix. Mm -hmm. um, so I I can't really answer that. I can't say that that academia supports religion or has tried to support religion. What it tries to do is to figure out what happened, how these people came to be, how they came to believe what they believe, okay. and how they came to write what what they wrote, a lot like historians. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and these disciplines are all linked together when we, when we look at history, even American history. We're not trying to support one conclusion necessarily. We're just right. trying to find out historically what happened. Why did it happen? But what is and the importance? When, it, it, how, how does that, at the end of the day, affect John Q. Public? Uh, how does understanding the American Revolution affect John well, Q. Public? I, I, we're not talking. It gives us a sense of, of where we came from, and I, I think there is huge value in that. The, the whole Western world today, at least the Western world, is rooted in certain events and things that took place on a, a faith level, on a religion level, 2,000 years ago. Judaism, Christianity, Islam came exactly from this fertile ground. And just understanding how we got here does a lot to help us figure out where we're going. Why did Christianity, Judaism, and Islam not spring up anywhere else? Why the Middle East? Because the Middle East is the seedbed of this curious idea that there is a single God. And that was a revolutionary concept was, in the ancient world. Didn't King Akhenaten and come up with that concept are, first? Are, pardon? Didn't King Akhenaten from Egypt also come up with this idea that there was a single God? Maybe. Maybe. Uh, although we can't really say that it's monotheism in the sense that we think of monotheism. That's also a debatable point. Um, I like to think maybe he somehow influenced the environment of the ancient Israelites, mm -hmm. but we're on thin ice, and the best we can say is, is maybe. Certainly he was not a true monotheist. That was a, an Israelite concept and revolutionary. It was the, the only the only worldview on all of the earth that declared that there's one single power in the universe. Um, and I think that is a, a modern concept as well. The idea that the universe is driven by a single, you, if you want to be scientific, call it a, a unified theory. Mm -hmm. uh, Einstein said, I do not believe that God plays dice with the cosmos. That, that was his Jewish monotheism speaking. What happens if one day Einstein is proven wrong? Well, he thought he made some blunders himself, actually, yeah. in his own day. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll face that when the time comes. <laughs> but there are laws in the universe, and I, I think they are, they are pretty much immutable. Well, I, I think Shakespeare came out with one real good law, and that's to thine own self be true. And I think I'll, that, I'll once, that. And once we start taking heed of that more... 
and being honest with ourselves, because if you can't be honest with yourself, you can't be honest with anyone else. And we need exactly. to we need to take a better look at ourselves and take more responsibility instead of depending on myths, instead of depending on legends or philosophy in order to help us lead a better life. I believe that we use philosophy, we use religion, we use legends, myths as a crutch. And I think that using those as a crutch has done more detriment for humanity than anything else. But that's only my opinion. I hear you, but be true to yourself. I'll uh, agree with you there. All right. You have a good day, sir. Thank you so much for joining us. Exo Nation, our guest has been this hour, Ken Hansen, Dr. Ken Hansen. And if you'd like to find out more about uh, Dr. Hansen, treasuresintime.org forward slash news dot html. This is the Exxon. I am Rob McConnell. If you're a skeptic or a believer, send me an email, exxon at exxonradiotv.com. I'll be back on the other side of this break as we continue from our broadcast center in beautiful Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't go away. Music.